Tell Me a Story Folklore and Irish Tales with Eddie Lenehan I'd like today to maybe mention animals in Irish folklore. Now, animals, of course, have always been popular in Irish stories, I presume because uh, people were so familiar with animals. Not in cages, not in small backyards, as might be the case in suburban living or city living or town living, but in the countryside, people were familiar with cows, sheep, useful animals, farm animals, but also wild animals, foxes, badgers, squirrels, animals like that, that were free to come and go as they pleased. But animals of the day, but also animals of the night, such as, as I say, badgers, but other animals too, animals you don't see too often. Animals such as weasels, for example. Now, weasels are a secretive kind of an animal. I've only seen a weasel twice in my life. Jumping out of the ditch, flitting across the road in front of a car, gone. But you ask yourself, if that's the case, why is it that there are more stories about weasels than any other animal in Irish stories? Or in Irish storytelling? And, of course, everybody is familiar with the phrase, Christ, he's as vicious as a bag of weasels, for a person who is bad-tempered. Because, you see, a weasel, you don't mess with a weasel. People always said that even an Alsatian, a pit bull terrier, will not take on a weasel, and a weasel isn't a big animal. A stoat, they might call it in England, but we always, in Ireland, call him a weasel. Because... If you back a weasel into a corner, the first thing he'll do is make for your throat. The old people used to always call weasels the Danes' cats, because it was said that the Danes, the Vikings, brought them to Ireland as their cats. And like all folklore, there's a piece of truth in the old stories of that kind, because if you back a weasel into a corner, his hair will stand up and he'll start spitting at you, just like a cat will. Now... Let me tell you a story about a weasel, one of many, many, many. I know a woman, not new, I know a woman, who had a little pup, a black and white sheepdog pup. And like most people who have respect for animals, she was very fond of her little pup. But she was a working woman and she had to be away from her home uh, early in the morning until late in the evening. And she was living in a country place, in fact, a narrow road. And you know yourself that Irish drivers are crazy, especially in narrow roads. And she walked her dog, of course. She walked her dog in the morning before she went to work and in the evening when she came home from work. And the dog was there in the yard all day then when she was gone, securely, I won't say tied up, but securely caged in, we'll say, so that he wouldn't get out onto that narrow road and maybe be killed. But I know from walking my own dogs, I have two dogs right here, that walking your dog can be a dangerous kind of thing because you don't walk your dog. Your dog walks you. They go here, snuffling here, snuffling there, and you, well, I at least, and most people, they allow their dog a piece of slack to do that sniffling and snuffling because they say a dog's nose is our eyes. Anyway... She knew that was dangerous because she could get killed on that narrow road by careless drivers. So what she did was she decided that take, rather than take that risk, she'd ask one of her neighbours, a farmer, uh, would he allow her to uh, let her dog into one of his fields if there was no cattle there and in the evening time when she came home and run around to exercise himself. And the farmer said, no problem at all, provided there was no cattle there. 
she'd stand at the gate, close the gate behind her, stand at the gate so the dog would come out on the road and let him run around, tire himself out. It worked fine. No problem whatsoever. But this particular evening she was there, as usual, watching the dog running up, running down, delighted with himself, as usual. When, all of a sudden, down the field, the dog stopped dead. And across that caught her attention. What was this? And then the dog started backing, backing, backing away towards her, slowly. And then she saw, coming out of the bushes, this group of animals. Now, she, they were a long way from her, to the big field, and she thought, they looked like rats. But there was maybe a dozen of them, she couldn't be sure, and all the time the little pup was backing, backing, backing away towards her. And they took no notice whatsoever of her little dog, only straight, straight across the field. And then she noticed that they had something on their shoulders, a couple of them, and the dog backing, backing towards her all the time. And then, maybe three or four feet behind the first group, another group came out, bigger, maybe 15 of them. She still couldn't know what they were because they were too far away. And the second group followed the first group straight across the field took no notice whatsoever of the dog. And by this time now the dog had come right up to her feet and was there shivering, shivering and whinging, 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 obviously terrified. And the two groups of animals had crossed the field by now into the bushes at the other side and gone out of her sight. And she asked me, what could that have been? Well, I told her, I know what it was. It was a weasel's funeral because I heard from the old people that when a weasel dies, what they do is they'll take the dead weasel up on their shoulders, like we might take a coffin, and take away the dead weasel to the place where they will have scratched a grave for it with their claws and bury it. And the ones that you saw coming up behind were the mourners, the relations of the mourners, and people that might wish to laugh at that, they needn't, because how well your dog, your little pup, knew to get out of the way. Because if he didn't, they would have torn him to pieces. And if you had been in their way, they'd have torn you to pieces as well. Because a weasel might be small, but they are utterly vicious. And think of what it would have been like then to have twenty weasels on you. They'd t tear you to pieces. And there are many, many, many stories about weasels like that. For example, a she-weasel is much more vicious than a he-weasel. They're slightly smaller, but they are much more vicious. And the old people always said that if a she-weasel spits on your head, you're guaranteed to go bald. Now, that's no joke, especially for a woman, because, as we all know, I don't know the statistics, but we'll say one in five or six men go bald anyway. And <laughs> the new fashion is shaving your head, uh, but for a woman, it's not funny because, well, not everybody is a Sinead O'Connor. And for an awful lot of women, it almost denotes cancer or cancer treatment. So uh, I don't think anybody would want to tangle too closely with a weasel. And you might ask, how could that happen? And you don't have to have a great imagination to to see how it might happen. A weasel could be in a branch of a tree. But how, how it used to happen most often was, you see, when rabbits were a staple diet. And remember during the First World War, especially rabbits were exported in vast quantities to feed the troops. Or for fur coats. It was a huge trade. For example, rabbits used to be exported here from Tubber Station uh, in, in, I don't know, hundreds of thousands from the local big estates. And they kept people employed, snaring rabbits. And what they used to do was they'd have ferrets to go into the burrows, into the rabbit wardens, and it was almost a professional job, and then they'd snare them coming out. 
But the problem is, you see, you can tame a ferret. I never heard of any person taming a weasel. They're a thoroughly, thoroughly wild animal. And sometimes when you'd be at your job as a rabbit um, snarer, you would be almost finished your job when your uh, weasel or your your uh, ferret wouldn't come out. He'd be inside enjoying himself. So you'd get down and put in your hand, hoping that you might be able to locate him. Um, I'm sure they had ways of doing this. Maybe, I don't know, could you call your weasel? But sometimes you'd put in your hand and it wouldn't be, because there's many burrows inside in a rabbit warren, and it wouldn't be your ferret would be inside at all. It'd be a weasel. And remember, when, a wee- when you put in your hand and a weasel's inside, what are you going to do? Except <laughs> uh, thinking he was being attacked. <laughs> and if your head is down near, you're going to get spat on. And a man who used to be a rabbit catcher like that told me that that's the reason why they used to always wear headgear. Just in case. Just in case. Because who wants to run the risk, as I say, of getting spat on, maybe going bald. Whether it was true or not, well, well, (laughs) just in case. And the other thing about weasels was that when people would be going out at night on a cord, maybe to play cards or playing music or whatever, they'd be all taking shortcuts through the land. You'd hardly go walking around by the road two miles if you could take a shortcut in three quarters of a mile and there'd be styles from field to field to field. But if you were going from field across styles like that or across ditches and disturbed a weasel's nest accidentally, well then, you see, if a weasel grabbed you by the leg or by the hand, weasels have a reputation of they won't let go, their jaws lock. As they say, do badger's jaws. I don't know whether that's true or not. But they will not let go. And the only way of making them let go is break a stick. And when a stick breaks, they think it's your bone breaking and let you go. And that's why people long ago had the habit of taking a piece of a stick in their pockets or whatever in order to, just in case a weasel grabbed you, make him let go. Now... I had a personal experience of that myself. My father was a good fisherman. Uh, Night fishing in the river field during the summer for the white trout. And he was also a harness maker. And he used to always keep his fishing bag inside the counter. And we were never to touch that fishing bag. He was very strict about that. And, you know, children, if there's a mystery, they'll always want to find out why, 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 why. And the reason, of course, was that he never wanted us interfering was there was hooks and minnows and sharp stuff in it. He only wanted to keep us from getting our fingers pricked. We didn't know that. But one day we got him gone. And we knew where he kept the key of the workshop. And (laughs) we went in and explored the bag. Uh, Disappointment. There was no mysteries at all. Only the hooks and minnows and flies and all that, like I say. But down at the bottom of the bag, I found this little bit of a stick, which I thought very, very strange because my father was terribly finicky about his fishing stuff especially. But we mentioned nothing because if we had, <laughs> you'd know we were in there and by God we'd have got, a, we'd have got something that we weren't expecting. But it was only years, years later that I did mention it and I was told that the reason why the bit of a stick was in the bag was just in case when he'd be down low, we'll say, on a strand, casting back with his fishing rod, and he had a big Castle Connell green hat rod. Uh, It's up there now. I still have it. And there'd be a high bank behind him where there'd be birds' nests. Those swallows used to make their nests, you know, in the high old mud banks. And weasels, of course, would go in there to steal the uh, the eggs, and just by freak accident, if he was casting back and a weasel happened to come out, the weasel might grab him by the hand, thinking it was being attacked. You know, a one in a thousand chance. But if it happened, if it happened, what would you do? So he always carried a bit of a stick in his bag, just in case. So my father believed it, and so did an awful lot of other people. It was better be safe than sorry, because a weasel would not let you go. So they were a very strange animal, and I had other stories that proved 
that that nearly know what you'd be thinking. A weasel. A very odd kind of an animal. The Danes cats. I heard this story from from a man behind in West Clare who kept a pub. Now you know yourself that it was possible to put the rats on a person and it was a poet that could do it. Others also, but poets were supposed to have terrible power according to the old people because they had the power over words. And this story was told to me by a man who experienced it himself. He had a pub in Ennis Diamond. And Ennis Diamond was a very, very, very busy town one time between markets and fairs and the West Clare Railway and, and all you have to do is pass through it yet and look at all the shop fronts. An amazingly busy town, the busiest town you could say in, in North West Clare at that time. And there was this particular fair day and he was to be up very, very early, of course, because, you know, the, the shutters had to be put, not shutters, but the old bars had to be put on the windows, you know, the, 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 the boards. At that time, you see, cattle, cattle, one kick of a cow's leg could send the glass of your shop in around the window. So they used to put iron bars and little boards across, not enough to keep out the light, but just enough to protect your glass uh, in your windows. Sometimes you can see the little the little things that on windows today that haven't been modernised in shops. You can still see the grips, the metal grips that used to hold the bar across. But anyway, this man, he told me that this happened. He said that on the early morning involved, he had to get up very early. And his wife kicked him out of it anyway to go down and put up the little, the, the little timber slats to keep the cattle the cattle at bay, you might say, because, you see, the cattle would be coming into the, the square there in Innes time and yes, they'd be coming in at five o'clock in the morning. And I suppose more of them coming in on the West Clare Railway. So anyway, he got out of bed and the timber work was there in the hall to be put up. But, he said, as he was coming down, he had the door just slightly open when he had this this noise pitter-patter, 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 coming down the footpath. And he thought, yes, whoever there hadn't they come into town fields early. It was just dawning day, it was one of the winter fairs. And he peeped out. And holy God, what did he see coming down the footpath? Only this squad of rats. And a huge rat ahead of Maul, as big as a terrier dog. And around his neck, a cord and a paper hanging from it. No person, no person, only the squad of rats. <laughs> and immediately closed out the door. Yes, he was one of them coming to me, because he had heard of the rats coming to people, or being sent to people. And immediately up the stairs, he was in his shirt, no, no pyjamas in them days, up the stairs, and he looked out the window above, and he saw them passing below. Now he described the big rat to me. Right, he said he was an old warrior. There was marks on him, marks on his ears, and marks along his tail, he had been, he said, in many and many a battle, but he said, thanks be to God, they passed on wherever they were going. Anyway, he dressed himself, he said, and he came down then, and very cautiously, he said, he opened the door and looked up and looked down, but there was no trace of any rats, and he put up the boards, and the place filled up due course, and he heard no more about it. But he said to me afterwards, he, he wondered who were the misfortunate creatures going to. Because, you see, the, 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 the bother was that if the rats were put on you, if you were a farmer, they'd, they'd destroy your hay, for example. They'd shit down along it. And what would you do then for, for fodder for the winter if you were a small farmer, which most of the farmers there around West Clare were? And if you were a shopkeeper, uh, if they were sent to you, you know what rat's dirt is. If they went up and in around your shelves or into your back place, they'd destroy your, your, your stock. What kind of a bad-minded person would send them on you? No, there was another side to that, of course. As like with all pishogs and that, and they could be sent back to you, to the person that sent them to you, and to be three times worse, it was said, if they came back to you. There was another man up around Doolan and he told me this story. 
he said the rats were sent to him. But he found out that they were. Now, he didn't explain to me how he found out. I just tell you the story that I was told by him. He found out that the rats were coming. And luckily enough, in the same parish, there was a man who had the power against the rats. He had a charm against the rats. And he went to him, of course, and begged him, would there be any chance, please, please, that you might do something for me? And, of course, the man... Once he had the charm, he was bound to use it. And he came to the house and he said, well, he looked around, he looked around, he didn't have to ask anything or have anything explained to him. I suppose he had dealt with this kind of thing many and many a time before. And finally he said, all right, and we'll step aside here. He said, they'll be coming shortly. And they stepped aside into a, a, a kind of a shady clump of bushes. And sure enough, a short time later, here come the rats. And it was the same kind of a story. One big old, old beater of a rat leading the other ones. And they came. And as soon as they were near, maybe 20 yards away, the man with the charm stepped out. Now the man that was telling me the story that the rats had been sent to, he said he was only watching and listening. But the man who had the charm, he held up his hand and he said something to the rats. Now the man said, I couldn't understand it, what language it was in. Maybe it was Latin or something, you say. But he spoke to the rats and they stopped. Like they understood him, they stopped. And he repeated it and he repeated it. Now... What I didn't tell you, what I forgot there was, your man before that had took out a knife, a sharp knife, and had embedded it in the ground, point up, no, no, blade, you know, sharp blade, upwards, before they stood into the bush. And whatever way he was talking to the rats, the big old rat that was leading them, forward, he came forward and forward, and did you ever see a dog that you were leading on a lead and when he doesn't want to come and he digs in the four paws and you'll have to drag him he said that's the way the rat was now and your man repeated what he was saying louder and louder and louder and the big old rat finally he came to the knife and as your man kept repeating what he was saying that your man couldn't understand finally he put his throat on the knife and he <laughs> cut his throat on the knife. And immediately he did, and the blood started to flow. The other rats lit a shriek out of them and scattered north, south, east and west. And he saw him no more. And then your man just said to him, look, take that rat and in over the cliff with him. Dump him. Which he did. And he had no more trouble from the rats after that. Thank you.